In today's episode of EU4, you'll see how to quickly and correctly unify Japan, as most guides get it wrong. I'll also build a powerful Japanese empire in the Indonesian and Pacific region, with colonies not only in Australia, but also along the entire west coast of America. Despite me making many mistakes, at least you'll learn what not to do. Hello, imperialist Lucas here. Today, I'll start unifying Japan with the Togukawa game, because they have a really good ruler, and the first two ideas count most for me. Remember, the Shimazu clan is the best militarily. There's no one better. If you're planning a world conquest with Japan, the Oda clan is the best choice. I looked for a clan with economic or colonial strengths but didn't find one, possibly because I only spent 10 seconds on it. If I missed something, let me know in the comments. But as mentioned, I'm not just unifying Japan today, I'll focus on conquering Okinawa and further colonization, which will expand once Japan is unified. However, I was very wrong here since I've never played Japan with colonization in mind. Initially, I sent the first diplomat to improve relations with the shogun, which is always worth doing. The second diplomat will wait because we'll soon start a war. Regarding our merchant in Japan, I change his assignment to either building a spy network or improving relations, whichever you prefer. For estates, I take monarchy points, cheaper advisors, and a few additional standard privileges. I'll recruit a cheap free company or an epic commander with a siege bonus, depending on whether I received a good commander from the state for capturing forts. That'll do. I recruit the cheaper company, then I I mothball the fleet, which will be temporarily useless. You can also sell it. Finally, I perform a trick for a cheaper advisor and will have a cheaper administrative advisor. Then I confiscate land, which some may not like. I don't form a marriage alliance with Hosokawa since we'll conquer them anyway. On November 30th, it's time to choose our rivals in Japan. The rule is simple. Pick countries without alliances or forts. There are three such countries in Japan at this moment. Three provinces? Who knows? They're easy to defeat and have few alliances, making wars against them very quick. However, I advise conquering Oda for their valuable dyes and agricultural lands, which give a development bonus. Yes, it's worth it to get this one as soon as possible. I avoid Toki and aim to conquer Imagawa first, because they're allied with Oda, which unfortunately has strong allies. I'll leave the third rival position open for now. On December 12th, I attacked Imagawa, especially towards Sengoku. To conquer Oda's province, but didn't call them separately, my armies first target Oda's troops. After defeating them, 1,000 troops stay in this province to maintain order and prevent the enemy from recruiting. The rest of the army attacks Imagawa's troops, eliminating them completely, despite being at a deficit, we hire our cheaper advisor to manage inflation. Honestly, we'll need a lot of administrative points, so my court will focus on administrative actions. After Oda's fall, their territories and money go to me. I don't conquer Imagawa's provinces, but take their money, war reparations, and most importantly, humiliate them for a lot of power projection. I immediately designate my next rivals, Ogasawa, Ogasawara. Now I'm engaging in more wars, but what's crucial is the reason for war, humiliating the rival. We don't summon data separately. After breaking their army, we occupy their capital again. Our forces are divided, but I believe we need to attack. How we make peace is very important, with countries not our main target. We only take money and war reparations, aiming for a very short peace period. Soon they will be our next war target. With our main target, we don't take humiliation, but show strength, which gives us 100 monarchy points of each kind. This will help us introduce institutions and avoid being technologically backward. We repeat these kinds of wars many times. I take the small discipline bonus, it's always useful. Show strength, show strength, and then move the capital, because it makes developing that province cheaper. The best part is our rivals will disappear quickly, so we can designate new ones and attack them again. We introduce technology, except for diplomatic, as I mainly want to develop my province with it. Oh wow, what a successor. Oh, it's a female successor. What was the status of women in Japan at that time? Time to find an easy name to pronounce, but my options seem limited. Oh, Ina will be nice. The year is 1450 and where's the Renaissance? Finally, it appears. Now we can introduce institutions in our capital. Remember, initially develop mainly with diplomatic points to the maximum value, then military. But of course, remember to activate all development bonuses before and develop infrastructure at level 15. It's very helpful when developing provinces. Unfortunately, after introducing the Renaissance, I can only have one rival. But by that point, I've already gained 15 1500 points, I even started making money. Here, frankly speaking, we'll attack immediately with Sengoku Kasuspelli to conquer all the provinces on our list. We have a technological advantage, so we'll easily break their army. Bang bang, another bang. This time I conquer many provinces, which could result in a small coalition. 
but it won't. Remember, when you care about administrative points, and we do because we still have a lot to conquer, it's worth reducing your war exhaustion before the coring process because it's cheaper then. It looks like I'll pay off all my loans. Oh no, one left, no. Hosokawa becomes our only rival for now, which is actually good, because it means I can humiliate a few more countries before continuing to conquer. Unifying Japan itself isn't a challenge. I have an episode where I do it in less than 10 years, but then we'd be technologically backward, probably still without the renaissance and undeveloped ideas Ideas. After all these wars, we can surely ask the Bushi estate for a better general. Really? Fire! This year. <coughs> After wars, we also want to reduce autonomy as quickly as possible, because the Japan region is characterized by a very high state, all because of our shogun, as shoguns often make this decision. Senkin Kotai, which causes all daimyos to have increased autonomy in provinces by 25%, or rather its growth. We have it so high that I recommend issuing edicts to reduce autonomy in every single province to lower it as quickly as possible. Autonomy is literally the worst economic modifier in this game, literally everything drops by a percentage, except for goods production and trade power. In the meantime, I'll build up my navy, actually just galleys, they'll be useful during the upcoming war. And the first government reform will obviously be higher taxes. We've also encountered our first incident related to Neo-Confucianism. If you want to understand how incidents work better, unfortunately, you'll need to consult Wikipedia and familiarize yourself with Shinto events. I know, it's a bit tedious. You go into the incident you have here, see what you can get out of it, and act in a way that gets you the right amount of points, since every decision gives you some points. In the end, this grants you some bonus for 50 years, whether it's technology discounts by 5% for 50 years, or other minor bonuses for the same duration. Besides, it steers your country towards either isolationism or open doors policy. Here are all the stages of isolationism, which also provide very nice bonuses. Now, a moment for quilling rebellions, of which I have quite a few, and wars with Hosokawa for humiliation. For the first era development, as I meet many of the conditions, I will first go for less aggressive expansion. But if you're cautious and plan to play like me towards colonization, then obviously a colonization bonus. First ideas, and since we want to engage in colonization, I mean I do, I choose exploratory ideas. And I got some quite nice generals. Now I can start the Japanese gold. Age. We can use this at the beginning and frankly later on with Japan, however I want to resolve my colonization ideas as soon as possible. Though waiting until level 7 of administrative technology would be even more optimal and cheaply develop two ideas at once. Initially I'll choose a colonization policy that doesn't require me to send troops to the colonized provinces. And now Our Lady Ina, the first Matsudaira, ascends to the throne. You won't believe it, but I again have great luck with the heir to the throne. I don't even know which one to choose. Yes, the prodigal son found his way home. You won't believe it, I no longer have any rivals. Well, since I didn't manage to take even more points, we'll just conquer them all. I'm really curious why those 9,000 won't destroy those 6,000. But they don't want to. We consume, we conquer, we conquer even more. And I can immediately take another area development, this time a bonus to colonies, and we conquer quite a lot really. And at this point, I need cheap mercenaries. So let them appear because we'll have a lot of rebellions. And now I'm conquering the last of the minor daimyos. Many people previously wrote to me in the comments that when they conquer a lot, Ashikaga kills their ruler. This has never happened to me. Nor has Ashikaga, frankly speaking, declared a war of independence on me, which is also bad. I can't fight my own wars. How weak. We continue to reduce autonomy, let's not forget about that. And I distribute edicts for faster autonomy reduction. Luckily, I can now colonize. And so our first island is formed. Frankly, I don't don't know if this is the best way to reach America. Probably not, so you can advise me on how I should do this now, whether I should quickly seize a province in Ainu and try to reach Canada through Kamchatka. Interesting, I can change my religion to Confucianism and also accept Shinto. I think this is the first time I've had this incident. But Japan, not Shinto, nah. Adopting Confucianism with Shinto as a syncretic religion is overpowered and pretty much ends any debate on the subject. We have many monuments nearby that we could use with this combination. If I were conquering the world with Japan, I'd switch to this religion. It's annoying that the last Daimyo shares my color, making everything blend together. With the last Daimyo gone, we're the only ones left under the Shogun, who's only a Shogun in name. I'm declaring independence from him since he didn't wage war on me, unfortunately. We've become a kingdom and a major independent Daimyo after our liberation. Interesting, I can have more samurais now. Shogun's army is gone. Wonder what happens if I don't declare independence but conquer the Shogun. Well, I'm the leader of this new Shogunite now, which changed our government form and allowed me to claim Okinawa after uniting 
Japan. Should I release a vassal? Why bother? The hardest part now is quelling rebellions. And now Japan is united, though a bit later than usual because of a long peace period with Hosokawa. We are ahead in technology and have completed the first exploratory idea. Next, we'll develop the expansionist idea. If you were playing a normal Japan, you'd be even further behind. And we're making money, have conquered Ainu, have no loans, just rebellions. <coughs> I finally made my first colony. More importantly, I can now unite Japan, giving me a lot of monarchy points, which I wasted, really. I'll grab some provinces early. Oh, Manchuria has emerged. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'll attack Kamchatka. Now, let's introduce tax edicts everywhere since autonomy isn't too high anymore. Time to unite Japan, which I totally forgot about, but will give us a lot of points. Tokugawa ideas aren't the best, though they have their merits. I prefer Japanese ones. We get discipline, strong infantry, more manpower, a stable country, cheaper technology, and development of institutions. Bonuses for ships, but more importantly, a colonization bonus and reduced aggressive expansion. We become an empire and face a problem. No shogunate. Let's introduce an elective monarchy in Japan. Honestly, I forgot this completely changes our mission. Exactly. Changes, not develop. Next, I want to develop Ichigo province to a level 10 production. Because completing this mission with 8 production points in Ichigo will bring gold to the province. And I like gold. Really, I'm this close? Establishing a foothold in the Philippines and immediately finding gold there. After establishing Japan, my income practically doubled. Why didn't I do this sooner? Am I stupid? I'll restore our color for better thumbnail appearance and upgrade my advisors to at least level 2. The best part? Korea is no longer a Ming tributary, so I can attack them. There's a great festival in Kyoto. And as Japan, we meet all the conditions for colonialism to appear. Fingers crossed, or at least give a thumbs up. I'm preparing for war with Korea and China and upgrading trade to maximize benefits from Nippon. I attacked Korea for the Jeju province, yay! And just like that, as Korea, we're far ahead in technology. Oh, I mean Japan. Somehow I have a mission related to conquering the new world. Just one. Did I mix up Japan with Korea? Seems so. Let's defeat the Korean army. I still have my infantry. I should have added cavalry to my army by now. But we're getting the job done. What should I do with Korea's Tripitaka temple? I think I'll take it for myself. Oh, a great successor. I'll start conquering Korea from the north, cutting it off from China. I've also captured Nan Madol, a monument that surprisingly speeds up our colonization right from the start, located on the island of Truk. Meanwhile, I can finally start colonizing the coast of America, though I'm not sure if it's actually America yet, I suspect so. I'll do the same with Australia to establish our colony there as quickly as possible before the British arrive. The birth of colonialism! For the first time, it's not the Europeans discovering America in I'm filling up Japan with workshops for production. Didn't expect that. I'm easily capturing their forts and wiping out their armies without losses, even though they have the mandate. Meanwhile, the Edo period begins, which historically lasted over 200 years due to this man's conquest. It was a time of long peace and prosperity for Japan, but also of strict oppression and social classification. Until American democracy arrived. The rest of the world knows this as Japanese isolationism. Though, if I were playing for Japan's development, I'd wait with isolationism until I could choose that mission and reach the third level of isolationism in religion. But I won't wait for that. I feel like I wasted an event. Beijing falls after 63 days of defense. I have no bonuses for this. What happened to the Chinese army? Wait, I have the eighth technology. That explains it. I've defeated another Chinese army, effectively ending our war. But I'll take one problem province in Suzhou from them to establish our foothold in the Hangzhou trade region. This is a crucial trade region for us because all trade from Nippon flows there before being sent to our target trade center, Malacca. I've also finished developing my expansion ideas which allowed me to use this colonial policy. And now it makes sense to grant some privileges to the colonies like reducing colonization costs or increasing the number of willing colonists. It seems our religious group is the only one without any colonial bonuses, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. I can finally expand my fleet, so I'll add 20 trade ships, allowing me to complete our mission on colonization. That only one. And this means I can start my little conquest. So let's establish our colonial footholds. We have a pretty good income as Japan. I'm recruiting around 3 to 4,000 troops in America, actually 8,000, because I first sent 4,000 on a mission to find the holy cities. Cities of gold, which were probably also considered holy. I'm also colonizing five provinces at once. In the standard way, I have always shown you. First, I sent three normal colonies in the Indonesia region to border the countries I'll be conquering. Once the first colonies began to form, I withdrew two colonists and sent them 
welcome to America with the expel minorities policy. This will soon be cheaper for me because I'm changing the third bureaucratic reform to the one that reduces the cost of expelling national minorities by 100%. I'm also preparing for wars in North America, but honestly, we won't be conquering much there. Just the trade regions of California, Rio Grande, and what's around there. Yes, I forgot about Mexico at this moment. I'll use our mission to discover the new world, though I wish there were more missions in Japan focused on building a trans-Pacific Japanese empire in the Pacific, no matter how oddly that sounds. I'm also carrying out the Bushido mission, the Book of Five Rings. Our country has given rise to many warriors of renown, but none has gained as much persistent fame as the legendary Miyamoto Musashi. Was this a manga? Being called the best duelist of the history of Japan, he won his first duel at the age of 13 and started traveling and participating in duels around the whole country, remaining undefeated. Now, we need to carefully consider our options and decide which path we will take. The path of the samurai remains unchanged. We only decide whether to transfer this knowledge to expanding our army or navy. Yes, expanding the fleet makes a lot of sense, so I will develop our army. Oh, I've got cloves, nice. Meanwhile, I'm at war with Manchuria, but really, I'm just using it to shorten my peace period with Ming. I am also transporting 5,000 troops to my Indonesian colonies because I'm changing my colonization policy to one that increases assimilation. Interesting, this is also a Ming tributary. I think 5,000 troops won't be enough to conquer these Indians. I'll have to bring more, but only after my next war war with Ming. Time for my first conquests in the Americas. Let's start with something easy. Because here, Zuni has really formed a large federation. The next war with Ming should be easy since they've decided to carry out the mandate of heaven. Only, who would have expected Korea to be involved in this war? And the first Japanese colony, Noa Mikawa, has been founded after our former capital. It will be an independent colony because it will occupy and support our colonial effects faster. Eventually, I'll turn it into a crown colony. From China, besides money, I'm getting a slightly larger area this time, but still not very big, all to increase our share in trade as much as possible. With the money earned, I start developing a monument for colonization, and with the rest, I build more production buildings, and most importantly, everywhere cart houses, because our empire is starting to grow rapidly. Actually, before I go to America to conquer there, I'll take care of conquering the Philippines, because I prefer to start conquests in America. When I have one large colony here that will support us in these wars, about 10 provinces in size, and the the Philippines conquered actually very quickly. Now I will also start their colonization process because why not? And I'll return to this region for more conquests in about 10 years. My army is transported to the new Kyoto because yes, we've got a new colony. Honestly, I hate this moment of conquering all these tribes. These wars aren't hard, but they are incredibly annoying. But Japan proceeds with the war. Yes, these wars are troublesome really, especially when they come and occupy your colonies. And another very annoying thing is how long it takes for your diplomats to return. In the last 10 years, I waged many wars in this region, conquering all the smaller nations. Now, I'm also focusing on colonizing the Molucas area and conquering all of Australia, which I named Top End, previously called the Japanese Top End. I'm curious about what's the reference. I also developed divine ideas because they offer a great mix of benefits for playing as Japan. Then I quickly subdued the minor tribes in Australia, allowing me to move on to conquer the last islands and nations in this region. Meanwhile, Ming collapsed, with smaller Chinese principalities emerging I seized the moment to conquer them, but only two, as the rest didn't interest me in my empire building. I noticed the Chinese emperor fled to Taiwan, which saved me the effort of colonizing it. So I'm preparing claims against it. After conquering two principalities, I'm now finishing off the once mighty Majapahit Empire. Really, they still have allies here. <coughs> but their primitive weapons stand no chance against us. Look, they still have spears, and it seems they haven't heard of armor. Who writes these mission descriptions? Do they really think I want to read all this? There's already so much, even more so. I've reached the third level of isolationism, pity not the fourth, but I messed up something before. Still, I'll carry out the mission to develop Japan. This reduces development costs and increases production for 20 years. With the fourth level of isolationism, it would work even better, especially during the Golden Age. But I'm developing the province quite affordably, especially since Japan has an amazing mission that gives us three development points per click. These two reforms are responsible for that. Yes, I would prefer production. Now, I face an important war to conquer Sunda. Its conquest will allow me to move all my trade to this region and significantly increase it, as it's currently minimal. After the conquest, I'll recall all merchants and build a trade route from the California coast through the Polynesian Triangle. I need to send ships and conquer more provinces here, especially in the the Japan region from where I'll get the most trade. Wait, does this go to Malacca? I always thought it went to the Philippines. Oh no. <laughs>
I don't have much choice and we're preparing for more wars. No, I personally hate conquering Brunei and Malacca. I'll use the time I need to core a provinces in the Moluccas to expand my trading companies. First, I'll increase production and trade power. This war will be a bit bigger. Yes, my fleet definitely has an advantage here. Our fleets show up and the enemies are either flee or are destroyed. Oh, they engaged in battle. Let's send more ships. So, our fleet is unmatched. After a while, I start another round of conquests and finish my business with Malacca. You're probably curious about what's happening in my colonies. They are not boring at all. The top end has been fully colonized. I've changed the colony type to a crown colony, something I could have done earlier. The great thing about these colonies is that they increase our maximum military size. If we had chosen a different type for the final colonies, they would have increased our fleet limit instead. But I already have a huge fleet limit. Another great thing about your colonies is that when you build military limit increasing buildings, part of that limit also applies to you. Let's check that out. I honestly have trouble choosing the next ideas for the colonial nation. Divine ideas won't work well here. Aristocratic ideas would be much better. Now I'm wondering whether to choose infrastructure, ideas or something else. I'd like your advice as I'm curious about your approach. Speaking more broadly, I rarely play to this point. What did Russia buy from me? And why so little? I've built up the whole top end with military limit buildings. Now from the top end we get 23 units. Almost 24. It might seem small but it's something. The Malacca area has been conquered. Most importantly I've finally moved my trade here which doubled or almost tripled my trade income. Next I'll focus on developing trade companies, something I've neglected a bit before. Though not entirely since I've built broker exchanges everywhere. It's the the first development you should build because it increases local goods production. The second development should be for production. Actually anything that adds local trade power plus four. It might not seem like much, but when added to several provinces, it's an additional 20, 40 trade. Always something. And building other developments isn't really worth it. Except for the one that increases investments by 1000 for the whole trade region. The most important thing is what increases trade steering. If we were England and controlled the trade flow from Asia through Africa to England, it would be worth increasing the trade value modifier by 10% in the initial nodes. But it's only in these initial Asian countries because it's not about every ounce of gold that flows into this trading area. But it concerns the value of trade generated by this region. But since we are Japan and collect in Malacca, building those developments isn't worth it. Regarding regular buildings and manufactories in trade companies, there are two, maybe three, worth building. First, courthouses. Every other province should have this development. Second, manufactories. It's not usually worth building production buildings. You can do it, but only at the very end. Autonomy and penalties from autonomy reduce their effectiveness by 80%. Except for production. That's why manufactories are worth building. If you have issues with governing capacity, only build trade companies in provinces with trade bonuses. Leave the rest as territories. Don't add them to trade companies. As for developing colonies and generating more income, currently colonies are very powerful in this regard. It's worth building both manufactories and production buildings, even taxes. Remember to protect your colonies, especially if they are large. With courthouses, they also have a governing limit. If exceeded, the colonies will go bankrupt and won't be able to handle it on their own. For now, my colonies generate very little income, so I focus on developing my trade company areas first. Thanks to our strong position, global trade has been initiated. Interestingly, where my merchants reach, we are the strongest trade power. Regarding our colonies, I'll eventually change all to crown colonies and modify the contract with each to increase our military limit. If a colony also sends gold transports, I modify the contract to always increase these gold transports to us. In the next 10 years, I've again doubled my income. I essentially control the entire western coast of the United States. Next, I'd focus on increasing my colony's military limits to soon conquer New Spain or Florida from the Spanish. I'm honestly curious about what the world would look like if Japan had created such a total, powerful, pacifistic, because it's in the Pacific, colonial empire. But in this episode, I'm creating a Swedish Baltic empire, but not just that. As Protestants, I'll also take over the Holy Roman Empire, Sweden is truly unique in this regard.